months ago, I, uh, I made a significant purchase. I purchased a car. It, it was new to me, not a new car, but uh, I bought a Chevy Volt. Anybody ever hear of this thing? So it's up front if you want to go admire it later. Um, yesterday, I, I, Friday and Saturday, I went to a conference out in Plymouth, Indiana, and then came back on Saturday, and I used a whopping one and 1.25 gallons of gas to get out there. It was crazy. Uh, this car is electric for a while. It runs off of a battery, and then after the battery is done, uh, it has a gas engine that turns on, and the engine, instead of powering the car, drives the battery and adds power to the battery so it can keep going on electric. It's like a hybrid on steroids, um, and it's just really fun. But that battery system isn't necessarily all it needs for everything it needs to do. So there's a, a, a button on the car that's, that says drive mode. And it's got normal, which is normal. It's got sport, which is really fun and really dangerous for me. But then it also has something called mountain mode. Because the battery would strain itself too much to drive that car up a steep incline or a significant you know, series of, of mountains. So what you do is basically you hit that button about 20 minutes before you're going to go into a mountainous area. Fortunately, in northwest Indiana, there aren't a whole lot of mountains. But you hit that, and what happens is that the engine then works in conjunction with the battery, and the two together drive the car. It gives it that extra added oomph that it needs and it helps it to accomplish something that it couldn't accomplish just on its own. We've been looking at how we change. And we've talked about different ways we all want to see life change. And we want to see ourselves to grow and take on more of the characteristics or image of Jesus. And if the goal is truly life change, what if we had a source of power we could go to, just like the car, so that we wouldn't have to do it alone? What if God himself was right there with us, giving us the power that we need for life change and for transformation? What does that look like? Today we're going to take a look. If you brought your Bibles, we're going to turn for two, first to 2 Corinthians 3. I'm going to begin reading at verse 17. If you need a Bible, I've got a little book rack at the back that's got about a half a dozen left on there. Uh, if you want to keep that, that's our gift to you. I love to restock that when it's empty. 2 Corinthians 3, starting at verse 17, it says this. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We'll stop there and let's pray. God, as we unpack your word this morning, as we look at this Spirit that the Bible is talking about, will you help us to lean in to hear from you today? to find that strength and that source of power that your word talks about. Help us to quiet down the concerns of our day, the to-do list that's circling in our mind, and to focus and lean in on you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Having access to power is important. If you have an outlet on your wall and it's covered up by something, it doesn't do you much good. You can't plug into it. Having access to authority is important. I used to be in sales and I used to make a lot of calls into businesses, large corporations or hospitals or schools, and I realized a little known secret of being able to gain access. It's this. If you walk like you know where you're going, most people will leave you alone to get there. If you walk in someplace purposefully and engage like you're heading somewhere and you know where it is, most people will just let you go. It's important to find where you're headed, though. It's important to get to the decision maker in a sales setting. But sometimes the one who has the power isn't necessarily completely clear. 
But getting that access is the key. Being able to get to them. Now back in the Old Testament, in Exodus 34, Moses, Moses is headed up to the top of Mount Sinai. And he's told to bring two stone tablets with him. And those stone tablets are going to be engraved by God with what we know as the Ten Commandments. Exactly. And Moses come down, comes down from the mountain, and everybody's kind of looking at him a little bit, like something's a little different with Moses. We know he went up to Mount Sinai, but he kind of looks like he went to Florida. Has he been hitting the tanning beds? What's going on with Mo? You think they called him Mo? I don't know. Because when Moses came down, his face was glowing. His face was radiant. It was shining because he'd been in the presence of God. And what happens then is Moses then covers his face with a veil for the rest of his time. He covers it up except when he is back up the mountain and back in the presence of God. When he's in God's presence, the veil gets removed. Now, being in God's presence is a big deal. Being in God's presence is something that not everyone at that time could ever possibly hope to achieve. For the Old Testament Israelites, God dwelled in the tabernacle, or he lived in the temple, in the innermost chamber of it. That's where the presence of God was. In the temple, once a year, uh, the high priest was chosen, at, at kind of a little drawing, to enter into that middle section, that holy of holies. And tradition says that uh, a rope would be tied around his ankle, just in case he, like, died becoming overwhelmed with God's presence so that he could then be pulled back out again because no one else could go in to that, chem to that center port of the temple. Being in God's direct presence was reserved for a very select few. For Moses, God dwelled on the mountain. After that, in the temple, in the tabernacle. And then something happens... In the New Testament, Jesus is born. And one of the names for Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. No longer is God just in that temple over there. No longer is God up on that mountain up there. But now he is walking and talking and laughing and crying right with us. The creator is among his created. When Jesus is taken back to heaven in what we call the ascension, he promises to send another, the Holy Spirit, to be among us, the third person of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit is now the presence of God, not in the temple, not on the mountain, not walking around Galilee, but right here, right here with us. John writes this. He says, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Another chapter back, he says, by this we know we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us his Spirit. Now we have access to God directly. Now we have access to that Spirit, the Holy Spirit, because He enters into us, the Bible tells us, the moment we believe in Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. You believe in God, and His presence dwells within you. It's just that simple. And that's what the verse is talking about in verse 18 of our passage today. We said, and we all with unveiled face. Because now we all are no longer being kept from the presence of God, but we have him right here. So just as Moses could take off his veil when he was in God's presence, we have our veils off. And that presence just isn't hanging out with us, but he is active and working and working in us and working on us working on the transformation of our lives that we've been talking about, working to make us more and more like 
Jesus. Verse 18 again from our passage. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is transforming us, is helping to make us more and more Christ-like. We see Jesus and we're being made more like him. We're being transformed like him and we're being transformed by him. We've been in the series, The Easy Yoke, looking at what it means when Jesus says to take up his yoke because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And what he's saying when he says, learn from me and how we grow to be more and more like him through the transformation of our character. Well, just like my car needs an extra oomph to go up a mountain, we can't do this alone either. We need help. And fortunately for us, that help is already within us at work. And before I go too much further, some of you are probably going, yeah, I don't feel what he's talking about. I don't see this, this, this change. I don't have that you know, voice. I've never felt a difference in my life. That's okay. We'll give you an opportunity in a few minutes uh, to take those steps or to talk about that, uh, what it looks like. But the question I want to lean in today is, how does the Holy Spirit change us? How does His work transform who we are? We all want to change, and we have things in our lives that we wish could be different. How does the Holy Spirit work toward that change? And we're going to look at a few of the ways the Bible tells us. The first one uh, is in Titus 3. The Holy Spirit helps us and changes us by making us new, by making us children of God. Listen to the passage. It says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. By the washing and re of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Christ Jesus our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The work of the Holy Spirit is in what the Bible calls regeneration. Another word for regeneration is rebirth, or where we get the term in Christianity of being born again. Regeneration uh, is distinguished from the first time we were born. Uh, we were conceived physically, and we were conceived with a sinful nature. But then there is a new birth, just like Mark read uh, after the first song today. We are made a new creation in Him. Regeneration is a new birth, a spiritual birth, a heavenly birth. And we are made alive spiritually. The Bible tells us that we were, we were dead in our sin. That we were dead in our trespasses. But then when we are, have the Holy Spirit, we are made alive, made new in Christ. And that happens when we put our faith in Him. Regeneration is a radical life change. Just as when we were physically born, a new life entered the earth, when we are spiritually reborn, a new life enters a heavenly realm. After regeneration, we see and hear and seek after divine things. And we begin to work toward living a life of faith and of holiness. The Holy Spirit changes us by bringing us intimacy with God. Ephesians 3 says, so that, in, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't just transform us by coming into us, but he brings us into a new and deeper relationship with God. Through the Holy Spirit, we can literally experience the presence of God in our lives so that we can know him better, to know the love of Christ. Because Christ, as it says, was dwelling right in our hearts. 
Spirit also illuminates the scriptures for us. It helps us to apply God's timeless truths in our current situation, to help us walk in step with God. Third, the Holy Spirit helps us through sanctifying us. We're dropping all the big church words today. 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all with unveiled face, this is from our passage today, beholding the glory of God are being transformed into the same image, the same image from one degree of glory to another. The Holy Spirit, when he's working in our lives, gives us access to the gifts of God. Ephesians 1 says the full gifts of God. He also, also helps us to apply those gifts in our lives and grows them through us. This process is called sanctification. It's the process by which we learn and live more holy. We grow into, grow more like Jesus, growing in his gifts, seeing the fruit of the Holy Spirit evident in our lives. The Holy Spirit also then works through us and gives us power to produce good for God and power to resist evil. 2 Timothy, Paul writes, For God gives us, gives us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. By the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. See, before Christ intersects with our lives, we are free to live a life full of sin. And we don't feel any conviction about it. We don't feel any guilt. We don't, we don't get any of that uh, feeling like we're going down the wrong path. That comes through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When someone becomes a Christ follower, when someone puts their faith in Jesus, that Spirit enters in and begins to lovingly convict them of their sin. Not accusation, but wanting us to be pushed toward a path of something better. The Holy Spirit grieves within us when we rebel, which is why we feel guilty as Christians when we sin. And that helps to push us toward repentance. That helps to push us toward asking for forgiveness. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can learn to exercise self-control, to say no to our sin. Fifth, the Holy Spirit helps us by opening our eyes to the truth. John 16 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So one of the biggest things the spirit does in our lives, he gives us the ability to see and be the ability to grasp God's truth what it is he's written for us, what all these words in this book actually mean and how they apply to us. Without the Spirit, people see the words of God and it all just seems like foolishness. But when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives working and moving, all of a sudden the dots begin to connect. All of a sudden the concepts begin to intersect with each other in ways that we would have never noticed without his help. The Holy Spirit literally opens our eyes and our minds to God's truth. The Holy Spirit also helps us by empowering our prayer. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Holy Spirit teaches us a lot of things, but one of the biggest things is he teaches us how to pray. Teaches us how to open our minds to the scriptures about prayer so that we can better understand the heart and intent of what God wants. So that we can see and understand that God can accomplish anything. And understand how we can ask that through prayer. But Sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where we don't know what is going on. We don't know what the solution is. See, all too often I think when we're in a problem, we tell God exactly what it is we need him to do to fix our situation. God, I've already figured this out for you. Here's my checklist. 
Let me send you a list of all the moves I need you to make. All the puzzle pieces you need to move for me so that I can get through this situation. This may come as a shock, but God doesn't work that way. We don't give him the to-do list. Our prayers aren't commanding him where to go. But sometimes we're in a situation where we don't know what the resolution is going to be. But all we can do is cry out to God. God, I need your help. God, I need you to see me through this. God, this mountain in front of me looks impossible and I don't know what to do. God, I'm at a loss for words. And it's in those moments and in those times when the Holy Spirit, God says, intercedes for us. When the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. When the Holy Spirit communicates with God the Father and says, this is what we need. This is how we need you to move. Groans that we could never understand or express, the scripture says. That is just six ways that I pulled together on how the Spirit works and moves within us. And there are a lot more. We could be here all day. We could do a whole series on this. But God moves within us to transform our lives, to move us towards something. I remember hearing messages like this as a kid going, you know what, that's great. And I'm pretty sure I'm a Christian because, you know, I accepted Jesus, but I don't feel any of this going on. I don't hear this voice of God. I've never spoken in tongues. There's never been a flame of fire over my head. I never see all this happening. The Bible says the Spirit comes and there's a rushing wind. It was windy outside last Tuesday, but I didn't think that was him. So the best evidence we have for the Spirit in our life is His fruit. Is His fruit growing within you? Are you living a life that's increasing in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control? Are those things, those fruits of the Spirit, are they becoming more and more evident in your life? Are you finding a calling or a desire to be more obedient to God in our lives? The Spirit isn't always dramatic in its appearance. But sometimes we can just have to stop and look and see if that's growing. When we struggle to feel that within us, when we struggle and wonder if it's even there anymore, when we doubt that love of God, remember the Savior's promise, I will never leave you or forsake you. John 14, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And we can continue to pray and ask God and God's Spirit to bring us that peace. The Holy Spirit enters into our lives at that moment when we put our trust and our faith in Jesus as our Savior. That's when He's sent to us. For some of us in this room, maybe that hasn't even happened yet. Maybe you go, you know what, I mean, I go to church and I, I listen to the stuff and that's okay and I sing, but I've never really taken that step to say, yeah, I believe Jesus. Yeah, fill me, Holy Spirit. Well, we're going to close in prayer in a second. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. And if you say, God, I have, I have, I have gone ahead and I have lived a life where I've kind of tamped down the voice of your Spirit, where I've gone about doing my thing and, and, and not really listen, and now I don't even know that I hear him anymore. I'm going to give you a chance to help reverse that too. So we're going to stop and we're going to pray. And we're going to give you an opportunity for both of those things. So pray with me. Dear God, you have offered us an incredible gift the gift of your presence. That you're not up on some mountain and that you're not off in a temple and that we don't have to be walking the streets with Jesus because he can be right here with us. That God can dwell within us as the Holy Spirit. God, what an incredible gift and one that we don't want to take for granted. God, use your spirit to mold us and to shape us, 
and to point us and direct us and convict us and all those things we talked about today toward walking in step with you, toward living a life that honors you, toward growing in our walk, growing in our faith. Holy Spirit, may our lives be filled with your presence. May we see the fruit of your presence in our lives as we grow more and more like Jesus. God, for some of us here, we've never taken that step. So right now, Lord, we pray. We confess that we are sinners, that we are guilty, that we have done things that don't please you, that we've lived a life that was all about us, that had us as the focus for that, God, we are sorry. And for that, we repent. We turn from that. And we ask your forgiveness. Because I believe you sent your son to die on a cross for me. To save me from the punishment I'm due. That you did what I could not do for myself and cleaned that slate and cleared that record. God, I come to you now to take, ask you to take control of my life. That you sit on the throne of my life instead of me. From this day forward, help me, God, to live every day for you. To walk in a way that pleases you. Fill me, Father, with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your presence. We love you, God. We thank you that we can spend eternity with you. We thank you for your son. We pray this in his name. Amen. <laughs>